Aquilina Soriano Versosa and Abigail Zelensky. Yep. And we just started to welcome folks into the room, Commissioner. So you're free to start whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you for being here, everyone. Welcome, Angelinos, to this month's uh, Know Your Rights and Bystander Intervention Training hosted by LA Civil Rights. My name is Araceli Campos. I am president of the city's new Commission on Civil Rights and today's moderator. I'm very happy to be here with you today. This training is available to anyone looking for more information on their rights and resources for stopping hate in our community. Trainings are held on the last Tuesday of every month. Sign up for future trainings at bit.ly slash stop hate trainings. And this is about culture change here in LA, spreading more love and having folks support one another. And that's where these bystander trainings come in, people helping people out. And that's what LA is about. During this very special Latinx, Latine or Latino Heritage Month and two, ba two days before Filipino Heritage Month uh, or Filipinex Heritage Month, we're offering this training in partnership with the Mexican American Bar Association and the Philippine American Bar Association to fo focus on hate fa facing the Latino, uh, Filipino, Latinx, Filipinex communities in particular. I wanna share that today's training includes live Spanish interpretation. Uh, to switch to your Spanish language channel on Zoom, just please click the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and select Spanish. Thank you to Ana Paula, our interpreter for today. We know that hate is rising in Los Angeles and across the nation against many communities. In 2019, we saw the highest rise uh, of hate crimes against Latinx people in over a decade. And 2020 saw a huge rise in anti-AAPI hate. LA Civil Rights has led a number of programs against hate, including on Telemundo, Channel 35, and many others. You can learn more at civilandhumanrights.lacity.org slash LA for all, or just Google LA Civil Rights. Uh, this training will explain the difference between a hate crime and a hate incident, we, and it will provide you resources available for victims, survivors of hate and discrimination, as well as tools for bystander intervention to make sure that we help out our fellow neighbors when we see something happening in the community. The following disclaimer uh, comes from our city of Los Angeles. Please know that the views expressed during presentations made at the Civil Human Rights and Equity Department or LA Civil Rights meetings or other events sponsored or co-sponsored by LA Civil Rights are those of the speakers and not necessarily of LA Civil Rights. Presentations at LA Civil Rights events or the presence of vendors at LA Civil Rights events does not constitute an endorsement of the vendors or speakers views, products or services this presentation and anything discussed during this presentation should not be construed as creating or intending to create an attorney-client relationship. If you require legal assistance, you should immediately contact an attorney. And in the future, uh, we'd love, love for you to contact us. <laughs> we will have time for questions at the end of the program. So please use the Q&A function of the chat box to ask any of your questions. This training is hosted by the City of Los Angeles Civil Human Rights and Equity Department, the Department of Public Works, the, the Los Angeles Police Department, the Philippine American Bar Association, the Mexican American Bar Association, and co-sponsored by the Los Angeles County Bar Association, the Filipino, Filipino Workers Center, the Asian Pacific American Bar Association of Southern California, the Japanese American Bar Association, the South Asian Bar Association of Southern California, the Southern California Chinese Lawyers Association, Parents, Educators, and Students in Action, and the Asian Pacific American Women Lawyers Association. Again, this training is open to all, and we invite everyone to join or co-sponsor a future training. I'd like now to invite Capri Maddox, Executive Director and our fearless leader of the LA Civil Rights Department to say a few words. Thank you, Capri. 
Thank you so much, Commissioner Campos. Uh, LA Civil Rights is excited to bring you this training on stopping hate. This is our fifth training in this series. And um, it's one of many events that we've hosted um, for a number of communities, the transgender community, the African-American community, the AAP, AAP. PI community and many more. I think at LA Civil Rights, we believe in being intentional about meeting discrimination, inequity and hate head on with resources to empower our diverse communities here in Los Angeles. This is why we launched the LA for All campaign. It is an anti-hate public service announcement campaign that has been translated into 17 different languages um, and engaged over um, 4,000 ad spaces across Los Angeles. And we just got word that LA Unified is interested in you know, placing this message of, of unity and belonging here in Los Angeles. And some of our commissioners and presenters even have um, the rainbow screen on the back that you guys, uh, right behind them, that you guys have seen all over town. And I think it's just important to know that um, fighting hate and discrimination is why we are building the Office of Racial Equity, Discrimination Enforcement, and much, much more that will be launching soon. And this is why we host this training to give you uh, the tools to keep yourself and your community safe. To learn more about us, go to civil and human rights, all one word, civil and human rights dot LA city dot org. Now, I am honored to introduce a strong supporter of our department and a man who has dedicate his, dedicated his life to justice and equity for all. Um, someone who has been a leader since he was a teenager, our very own council member for the first district, uh, Councilman Gil Cedillo. Hi, I'm uh, Gil Cedillo. I'm your Los Angeles City Council member. I wanna thank you for participating today in this program against hate. You know, hate manifests itself in many ways in our society. It's in restrictive housing covenants. Uh, it's in laws that don't allow Filipino men to marry women outside of their community. Uh, it uh, manifests in its uh, immigration policies, putting kids in cages. So there's a lot of hate in our society and we live at a time where uh, there's a lot of divisiveness in our community and a lot of extreme acts taking place. We can't solve all the policy problems and it makes it difficult for us as we live trying to aspire to have a community that's united, that's cooperative, that's civil and democratic. But there are things that we can do and that's why we're here tonight. I have committed myself to building a better community since I was an activist in the Chicano moratorium over 50 years ago. Uh, I know that in our communities run side by side and have had many similar experiences. And so I want to applaud you for being here tonight. Uh, there's a lot of places you could be, but you've chosen to be here to participate in this program and to really do what you can do as an individual, as a member of our community, to fight hate. You know, our communities, the Filipino and the Latino community, the Chicano, Mexican American community, a lot of similarities in history and a lot of similarities in all our hopes and aspirations. We come to this country, we work hard, we take the most difficult jobs, uh, and we work at them not for ourselves, but for our children so that our children can get uh, a part of this great American dream especially here in California. And so, again, I wanna thank you for being here and what you're gonna do uh, in your training and to be here to, to combat hate uh, as it manifests both in its public policy, but also as we see it manifesting in individual cases and circumstances, there are things that you can do to make this a greater city. And I thank you for that. Thank you, Executive Director Maddox, and thank you, Council Member Gil Cedillo, uh, someone from the immigrant community. We're all so grateful for the Council Member's leadership in defense of all communities here in Los Angeles, uh, certainly starting with his role in the California Dream Act and defense of documented community members. 
and so much more to come. So thank you for being part of this event. Uh, and now I would love to introduce you to our amazing panelists. Uh, and I'll uh, please ask them to wait as I introduce them. The first will be Commander Ruby Flores. Commander Flores is the uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for the Los Angeles Police Department. After Commander Flores, we, have, we will hear from Adrian Rojas, a former deputy district attorney and now a victim's rights attorney. After Adrian, we'll hear from Aquilina Soriano Versosa, executive director of the Filipino Workers Center. And finally, we will hear from Abigail Zelinsky, my fellow commissioner on the Commission for Civil Rights and a wonderful employment attorney in her own right, as well as president of the Philippine American Bar Association. So with that, I would love to turn it over to our first panelist, LAPD Commander Ruby Flores, if you can please explain to us the differences between a hate crime and a hate incident, and what are some of the steps that LAPD is taking to respond to the increase in hate in Los Angeles? Yes. Hi, bienvenidos everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, first I do wanna just recognize and um acknowledge that tonight is is uh, taking place during a significant month for in celebration of our heritage so i am proudly representing the department not only because of my job but i'm also the the highest ranking latina in the department and as the thank you as the the daughter of a of an immigrant who came from from la ciudad juarez in in mexico I clearly understand some of the, the fears and uh, the challenges that our community and that our our um, our people have to under, have to um, endure. And to that end, I have a passion to help all walks of life, all of our people. But even more so tonight, I take brought take take great pride in being able to be a part of an event like this, so that we can encourage and raise awareness when it comes to hate crimes. Um, as you did hear. Um, hate crimes against um, Latinos has increased. Um, it's increased um, not only against um, Latinos, but also against our Asian American um, um, partners within the community. Um, sadly, the hate crimes have risen in all areas. So regardless if you're Latino, if you're gay or lesbian, a woman or man, a member of the the um, Islamic religion or Arabs, the the hate crimes are up as well as hate incidents. So I will talk to you about the difference of what a hate crime is versus hate incident. Um, but I, I would hope to think that many of the crimes are also up because we are raising awareness in what a hate crime is and how to go about reporting them. So I would urge everybody to understand number one, not to fear calling the police or fear to report a crime um, because we are here to protect you and that's all that we want is to make sure that everyone understands that they're going to receive equal service from the los angeles police department and if you would call as a bystander you can do so in confidence and anonymously as well those are always um, options where we want to try to maintain um, confidentiality for those where we can. Um, so a hate crime is, is, is an act, a criminal act directly directed to a specific person. Um, and it's that act um, that is where the victim is targeted based on their real or their perceived race, nationality, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, or gender. So that would be an example of, let's say a robbery or a theft or a battery or some type of crime that occurred in conjunction with um, the, the fact that they're being targeted specifically based on those uh, protected classes that I just described. A hate incident might be something that you see or hear about um, where it, there might be something that's, uh, there's an act of vandalism or a flyer that is put on your car um, that is directly targeting you based on your uh, pr protected class. So again, it's directed towards a person or persons based on the victim's actual or perceived race, 
nationality, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, or gender. So really the main difference is there's, it's not a crime. There's not a criminal act against the person. Many times you'll see it in, um, as I stated with graffiti, um, resulting in property damage. Um, some of the ways that we'll, we can talk about uh, reporting is just simply by calling 911. If you have, um, if you are being the victim or you're witnessing someone being victimized, certainly call 911 right there in the moment and describe what you see. Um, being a good witness is always uh, the best way to go so that you can describe the individual um, from head to toe so that the officers get there and um, be able to, to provide as much information as you can to uh, the 911 dispatcher. Um, there's other ways that you can, you can also report is through um, the 311 system, which is um, another mechanism for reporting. Um, you, I would say you cannot um, report this crime online because we want to be able to talk to someone and we want to be able to get that information that's critical um, to get that information from a victim or a bystander. So that would be um, the best and the most effective way so that we can understand who's being targeted, why, the circumstances, um, and then we can get extra patrol, we can get you outreach, and we can get officers to assist you and provide and get you resources that are offered by the city as well. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Commander yeah. Flores. Um, and next up, uh, call on Adrian Rojas. Adrian is a longtime uh, victim's rights attorney a uh, deputy district attorney, and congratulations are in order because he is the president-elect of the Philippine American Bar Association. And we'd love for him to share some of the resources and rights available to survivors or victims of hate. Adrian. Thank you, Commissioner Campos, for that introduction. Uh, before I start my presentation, I do have to repeat the following disclaimer, just in case you missed it the first time around. Um, the views expressed during presentations made at Civil, Human Rights, and Equity Department, also known as LA Civil Rights, meetings or other events sponsored or co-sponsored by LA Civil Rights are those of the speaker and not necessarily of LA Civil Rights. Presentations at LA Civil Rights events or the presence of vendors at LA Civil Rights events does not constitute an endorsement of the vendors or speakers' views, products, or services. This presentation and anything discussed during this presentation should not be construed as creating or intending to create an attorney-client relationship. If you require legal assistance, you should contact an attorney immediately. So here we are over 18 months into the pandemic and hopefully we're seeing some sense of normalcy. And unfortunately, even though we are easing into uh, some you know, normal aspects of, of what life was like before the pandemic, we are still seeing an increase in hate incidents and hate crimes. And as Commander Flores explained a few minutes ago, a hate crime is in fact a criminal offense against a person or property motivated in whole or in part by the offender's bias against a race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, ethnicity, gender, or gender identity. Now in California, a hate crime requires more than just a racially motivated statement. So while a statement such as, go back to where you came from, that statement might be classified as a hate incident. Uh, in the criminal arena, there needs to be more than that statement. Usually we require a statement plus a threat of violence, actual physical violence, or destruction of property. Now, it's been said many times in the past few minutes, Commander Flores talked about it. Um, we have all seen the rise in hate incidents and hate crimes on news and on social media, especially as it relates to our Latino communities and our Asian Pacific American Islander communities, as well as the Filipino communities. And we've seen enough of these incidents on social media. And there's usually two commonalities that I've seen when I see these incidents or hate crimes on social media or on the news. The first common factor is that it happens in a public area or in an open area. It's on a sidewalk, it's on a bus, it's on a street corner. And the second common factor, unfortunately, is that there are people who are either videotaping it or 
uh, just kind of standing around doing nothing as this hate incident turns into a brutal crime. And when we see these hate crimes posted on social media and on the news, my reactions are usually to the tune of that's horrible, or I would have fought back, or I would have intervened. Or if you're like my wife, she would say something to the effect of I would have grabbed my pepper spray and sprayed the hell out of that guy. Um, and I realize that my wife says this because she has a basic understanding of uh, self-defense laws. She's also an attorney. And to the average person, however, the average lay person who's standing on the sidelines, and as they see these hate incidents occur to a random person, as they see these hate incidents turn into brutal hate crimes, I'm pretty sure they're wondering, what can I do to protect myself? What can I do to protect that random person who is being attacked? Or I'm sure you've thought to yourself as you're seeing this on the news, I wonder if the law is on my side if I choose to respond with force. And most of us have seen on the news um, several months ago, uh, an elderly Asian lady who was attacked on the corner of Market Street in San Francisco. And that, that, that video made it viral on the news and on social media. Uh, we saw how she fought back and defended herself. And to some of the Filipinos in our audience, we might remember uh, the video arising out of New York City where the victim in that case was an, a Filipino American woman named Vilma Carey who was attacked on the sidewalk um, as two men uh, were standing watching within five feet of the incident, um, watching this woman being attacked by the assailant. And once in a while, we do see videos where third party bystanders do intervene uh, and help the victim or the, the victim who is being attacked by the assailant. Now, now, God forbid you're ever in that situation, but what are the basic rights and general rights under California law? And how does the law assess whether you're acting in self-defense or lawful self-defense of others? Under normal, normal circumstances, outside the context of self-defense, if you were to use deadly force on someone, then you would be criminally liable for charges that would be brought against you by a prosecutor, normally the city attorney or the district attorney. However, if you acted in lawful self-defense, then you would not be liable for a crime, and that would be a complete defense, which means that you are protected from criminal liability. Now, unfortunately in California, the law is wrangled with legal jargon, and the general rule um, is that if you use lawful force when you reasonably and legitimately believe that you or another person are in imminent danger of physical harm and that the use of force is necessary to stop the danger. Now, of course, that begs the question of what is lawful, what is legitimate, and what is reasonable. Law enforcement and the courts will require three elements to be fulfilled if you want to use self-defense. And in, in court, uh, the three elements are broken into these uh, factors. Basically, whether you reasonably believe that you or someone else was in imminent danger of suffering bodily injury or was in imminent danger of being touched unlawfully, and you reasonably believe that the immediate use of force was necessary to defend against that danger, and you use no more than you use no more force than was reasonably necessary to defend against that danger. Now you notice I said end all three of those elements must be fulfilled in order for you to be protected by the lawful self-defense laws. Now, what does this all mean? The law will look into the imminent danger aspect, which means that the threat or threat of harm must be imminent and it must be immediate. Now, let's take the case of the elderly lady who was standing on the corner of Market Street and she was punched and it was unprovoked. And we saw how she picked up a wooden stick and started bashing her assailant on the face, on his body, and she was able to defend herself. Now, in that particular case, the immediate, the, the, sorry, the threat was immediate. It was imminent. It was happening um, as she was standing on the street corner. But let's say, for example, if someone said to you, I will kick your butt next year because I hate what you look like. Obviously, that statement is not imminent because the threat is something that is going to happen in the future, in this case, next year. So when you, when you consider the imminency, it has to be immediate. Now, the law will also look into the degree of force that you use, and the key word is reasonable. The force must be proportional to the threat of harm that you are facing. 
And as a general rule, if someone came up to me and said, go back to where you came from, and he sucker punched me on the face, I would be justified in, in socking him back maybe once or twice, just to make sure that the danger ceased and that further threats ceased. However, if I pulled out a hammer and started bashing that person on the head and all over his body, that would not be proportional to the force that I was faced with, in this case, that one single punch. Now, if you witness an attack, you might also wonder what are your rights as a bystander uh, watching these attacks as it happened? Should you intervene? And you may remember the attacks from uh, the, the New York City incident with Bill McCary. I talked about it a few, few minutes ago. Uh, she was the elderly lady who was walking to church and her body was stomped on. Um, the assailant said, go back to where you came from. Um, she was clearly, she presented as an Asian woman and um, she was brutally attacked for about two to three minutes. And two men who were working in the hotel lobby um, watched within five minutes, sorry, within five feet of the incident. And they did nothing They actually closed the glass doors um, to protect themselves. Now, the question is what rights did those individuals have, the two men who closed the doors, if they decided to protect the victim, Bill McCary? Now the set, same law would apply uh, from self-defense to defense of others. So you would have to fulfill the three elements that I talked about earlier in order for you to be um, acting in lawful self-defense of others. Now, again, this is a very brief general overview of what self-defense laws are. And I think Commander Flores can, can attest that it does get very complicated, um, but there are three things I do want you to keep in mind. If you are thinking about intervening or if you're thinking about defending yourself. And, and obviously these things happen very quickly. But what I do want you to remember is, are you in imminent danger? Is it an immediate danger? Um, and are you in immediate danger of suffering great bodily injury? And is it reasonable for you to use that force that you need to protect yourself? And lastly, is the force that you are about to use reasonable and proportionate to the force that you are being faced with? There are also other ways that I will briefly talk about um, that involve nonviolent uh, self-defense. Um, one of the most effective methods that I've learned over the past 18 months was presented by iHollaback.com. And I think um, that link will be in the chat room in, in a few seconds. But the method, methods that iHollaback.com uh, sends is that there are five Ds uh, in terms of nonviolent intervention. And that is to distract, delegate, document, delay, and direct. And I will um, invite you to look at that website as it explains what those five Ds are. But if you're not in a position to intervene with violence or to protect another person with violence, th these are five Ds that can help yourself and other individuals who are in the midst of a hate incident or hate crime. And there are also other non-lethal and completely legal self-defense weapons that are available to you in California. And I want to stress non-lethal because for the purposes of this um, uh, evening's presentation, I'm not going to talk about gun laws. Uh, but for example, if you go to Costco, you, you might've seen that pepper spray that, that they were selling. It was two for 20 bucks. Um, there are pepper spray laws that um, allow individuals, if you're of age and if you have no priors, uh, to carry self-defense pepper sprays. And, and the, the law requires it to be um, no more than two and a half ounces. Um, you are also allowed to carry stun guns for self-defense if you're of age, again, and if you have no priors. Um, and you're also allowed to carry knives. Um, but I do want to direct you to Penal Code Section 21510 which specifically talks about the knives that you are not allowed to carry. Um, and, and just make sure that obviously you look into this, uh, these um, non-lethal uh, methods of self-defense before you go out and buy them. Um, and one of the things that I do want you to think about as a victim or a witness is that under a few circumstances, you have the right to request that your information, your personal information, your address, telephone number, uh, contact information can be kept from the public. And many police agencies, including LAPD, I know for sure, uh, they have victims resources available on site at the police stations. 
And oftentimes there are victim services representatives who are stationed at the police station to help you if you've been a victim or witness of a hate crime or any crime in general. And there are several other resources available to you, including the Victims Resource Compensation Board. Um, in each county, uh, in California, each county is required to have a Victims Resource Center. And normally this Victims Resource Center is centered at the DA's office of that county. And each center has a victim advocate who helps victims find counseling, uh, who helps survivors find housing, who helps them prepare for court and apply for restitution or compensation or even to get protective orders. And these are all free services of the DA's office. Um, and in, in Los Angeles County, one of our, our resources is Monica Sebastian, who also happens to be a Filipina. And she is a supervising victims services representative in downtown LA. And she is ready and um, eager to help any victims of any crime, uh, whether it be a hate crime or any crime in general. Now, I did talk about the Victims Compensation Board, and this is a state funded uh, program that helps uh, reimburse victims of violent crimes for certain medical expenses, for certain uh, loss of wages, and for relocation and also loss of income. And these, this is another set of uh, resources that are available to you at the state level in addition to the county level. And again, uh, the uh, victim services representative at the police station or at the DA's office can help you access these funds. And there are paperwork and uh, criteria that must be fulfilled, uh, but this is a, a program that is open to a victim or a witness of any crime as long as you qualify. Now, since many of our audience members tonight are probably from the LA area, I do want you or I encourage you to visit the LA City Attorney's website and the LA County District Attorney's website uh, to access uh, victim or survivor services and other resources that are available uh, to victims and witnesses. And I, I do want to put in a plug for the City of LA residents. Uh, the City of LA has an app that is available for a download and their resources are available in 14 different languages. Um, and I do want to end on this note. I, I'm, uh, you know, the reality is in dealing with victims or survivors of crimes, um, I, I can, I understand that these victims and survivors will feel very alone and isolated and embarrassed. But if anything, hopefully after tonight's presentation, you'll feel a sense of empowerment because there are rights and resources available to you. Um, and I hope that you are able to uh, take advantage of those rights if needed. Thank you so much, Attorney and PABA President-Elect Adrian Rojas uh, for that information. As a friendly uh, reminder to everyone, there's wonderful information that's being um, put into the chat. So all the resources that our wonderful panelists have been mentioning are, are being placed into the chat. And also we will, our panelists will be taking questions at the end. And so if you can please enter any questions into the chat or in the Q&A uh, feature, we will um, get to them at the end of the program shortly. Uh, so next up, uh, we are honored to have someone who so many of us, including me, <laughs> admire from afar, a wonderful community leader, Aquilina Soriano Versosa. Uh, Aquilina is founder and executive director uh, of the Filipino Workers Center of Southern California, a nonprofit founded in 1997, serving and organizing the low wage Filipino com immigrant community in Los Angeles. Uh, she has spent over two decades working in the Filipino community and in fighting for workers and immigrant rights. And we'd love to hear her perspective on how um, the current um, um, issues of hate and, and bystanders protection um, are playing out on the ground and, and her reflections over the past couple of years on this issue. Akilina. Hey, thank you, Araceli. Um, and thank you for having me on this, um, on this uh, web, webinar. Um, it's great for us to be able to provide these types of resources to our residents and, and to keep visibility um, that is part of what um, Filipino Workers Center is really advocating for and involved in keeping up um, visibility to this issue. Of course, um, since uh, the pandemic started, um, the rise in hate crimes against our um, Asian 
um, American Pacific Islander communities, um, you know, skyrocketed as um, our communities have been blamed um, um, very intentionally for this um, pandemic. Um, and with um, with the current uh, former clim uh, climate of um, uh, of our last federal administration not being very friendly to immigrants, you know, it actually really um, created so much um, fear um, and stress um, in the community. And these hate crimes, um, you know, definitely impact you know the individuals who, um, even if they're incidents and they they don't reach the level of uh, hate crimes, they are very, very damaging to all of the individuals experiencing it and to the community at whole, really impacting the, the psyche um, of the whole community. And so what we are advocating for is really building more um, radical solidarity with each other and um, really understanding um, how, um, you know, versus blaming individuals for the pandemic. This pandemic has shown us how connected we actually are and how um, it also has brought out a lot of um, good in terms of mutual aid and really bringing about, about a lot of um, you know, a spirit of um, support between, between residents. Um, we are supporting also um, the uh, the, the five Ds that um, that Adrian also mentioned is also in a training, a bystander training that's being hosted here locally by um, Asian Americans Advancing Justice. Um, one that's happening actually today, uh, earlier today actually, um, and there'll be more. Uh, they can be um, they can be registered for on the Advancing Justice uh, website. But it actually walks you through the process of really understanding these Ds, which is like about distracting, um, you know, other things that are that don't have to be as um, difficult as you're considering possible legal action. You know, there are many things that you can do as a witness to be able to help um, a, a situation where you see a hate crime happening um, and um, before and, and afterwards as well. It's our responsibility as community members to really provide um, support uh, for victims. And, and at PwC, uh, we've been uh, working and supporting survivors of human trafficking um, for, um, for many years now. And so really bringing that um, trauma-informed kind of uh, case management and care to those who are also experiencing um, these types of hate crimes, um, because part of the damage and hurt is also about um, feeling isolated um, and feeling, as Adrian said, possibly um, embarrassed and shame, and, um, and bystanders um, can do a lot to um, to possibly intervene in many different ways, um, as well as uh, afterwards be there to support uh, the victim and see how they may be able to assist and help and even provide uh, just moral support, identifying that it is racism, that it is, um, you know, that it is something that um, was, uh, was, was a crime you know, um, whether whether it's a legal crime or not, it is a crime um, against an individual. Um, so we really encourage folks to reach out. There's also the Stop API Hate uh, website that has a lot of resources as well about all these issues, how to talk with um, children, teenagers about this issue. Um, and we continue to hold public events. So we had a vigil in honor of the victims uh, the women that we lost um, in um, Atlanta, as well as created um, a public display of trees uh, where people can write their reflections and, and prayers um, and hopes um, and thoughts of, um, of resiliency and solidarity. Um, uh, and it's um, traveling around to different places. Um, and so it's just very important that we continue to build bridges uh, between communities within the API community, within uh, our all of our different communities here in Los Angeles, so that we can understand um, that uh, uh, understand some of the historical context, 
to how um, these kinds of hate crimes have impacted our communities and how there's also been a, a long legacy of us standing together with each other uh, to defend each other, to support each other in times like this. Um, and so um, if we encourage anyone to reach out to us at Filipino Workers Center um, to also uh, to build bridges, to engage in discussions. We can also help to, to host discussions um, about uh, Asian American, uh, the hate crimes that are happening now um, and connect you and individuals individuals if they are victims it's you know you're not alone and we can also help you support you to help you navigate um because sometimes it's very difficult to navigate what are the resources what are the options if it is there is something legal or not if there's mental health services that can support uh medical help um we're we're here to also help and support to you so i'll pass it back to you Ada Seven. thank you Thank you, Executive Director Aquilina Soriano Versosa for that presentation. And to round out um, our presentations to go into the employment context, um, I'll call on my fellow commissioner with the Commission on Civil Rights, Abigail Zelensky. In addition to her role, she's a longtime employment attorney and the current president of the Filipino American Bar Association. Thank you, Abigail, for sharing how this has uh, impacted the employment context. Thank you. Thank you, Commission President Campos. Um, Madam and Salamat, and muchas gracias for joining us tonight. My portion is going to include a brief overview of your rights. If you experience hate incidents in the form of discrimination and harassment at the workplace, you're protected if you're the subject of discrimination and harassment, or if you are a witness to the discrimination and harassment. While the newly formed LA Civil Rights is not yet able to take cases, when it does, it will be able to take complaints on discrimination in housing, commerce, education, and employment by private actors that has happened within the city of Los Angeles. And just a little background on the LA Civil Rights Commission. It was established in 2019, and the commission came as a result of work from various advocacy groups like the Black Worker Center. And a year later, the LA Civil Rights Department was formed at the end of 2020. The purpose of LA Civil Rights is combating inequities and discrimination. And now to dive in. California law and federal law prohibit workplace discrimination and harassment on a wide range of protected categories. Because California law is typically more protective than federal law, I'm going to focus on California. In California, it's illegal to discriminate or to harass an employee based on actual or perceived or association with and I'm going to give a little laundry list of various protected categories so we're all on the same page. Race, color, ancestry, national origin, language, citizenship, religion, religious creed, which can include religious dress and grooming practices, sex, which can include pregnancy, childbirth, breastfeeding, or related medical conditions, gender, gender identity, gender expression, age, if you're 40 and over, sexual orientation, veteran or military status, physical or mental disability, medical condition, genetic information, and marital status. So you can see there are a lot of protected cat categories under California law. Discrimination is when you are treated differently or unfavorably based on your protected status in one of those classes. Discrimination will have some concrete adverse employment action that's motivated by your protected status, your perceived status, or your association with that status. And so some examples of workplace discrimination can include being terminated, being demoted, suspended, um, being put on a PIP or a performance improvement plan, especially when others haven't for similar infractions, a poor performance review, not getting selected for a job, not being promoted, 
um, an undesirable work assignment or work location. And so if this has happened to you and it was motivated by your protected status, then there may be a violation of law and you should report. Unlawful harassment, um, which is a little bit different from discrimination, um, includes disrespectful and unprofessional conduct and the harassment can be verbal, such as slurs or jokes or teasing, visual, such as posting or distribution of emails, computer displays, um, symbols, cartoons, or physical conduct, such as physically threatening another person, blocking someone's way, or making physical contact in an unwelcome manner. So your boss, manager, supervisor, and your coworkers are not allowed to discriminate or harass you. And your employer can be liable for the discrimination harassment if you're being treated this way by customers or clients or vendors or any other third parties at work if your employer knows or should know you're being harassed because they need to prevent it from happening. So there are two important agencies on the state and federal level that address harassment and discrimination when it happens in the workplace. The first is the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing, the DFEH, or the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or the EEOC. You can file a complaint either with the EEOC or the DFEH, and we'll put a link in the chat. Um, the two agencies, they have overlapping jurisdictions, which means that they can often take on the same complaint, but that's not always the case. And if you're uncertain, generally speaking, like I said, California law is very employee friendly. And so usually will be more protective than federal law. So it's always a good idea to try the DFEH first. It's the job of both agencies to enforce these civil rights laws and to protect people from unlawful discrimination. So they'll investigate on your behalf. And depending on their findings, they may file a complaint and prosecute. If they decide not to prosecute, you'll get something uh, called a right to sue letter and you can pursue it um, with a civil lawsuit of your own with a private attorney or uh, on your own. And you should always be mindful of timeframes. And with anything concerning your rights, the sooner the better. Um, in these types of situations, like I said, you don't need to hire a private attorney, um, though you may. If it happens in the workplace, it's very important to make a record. So whether or not you are going to file a claim with an administrative agency, you should always report it to your manager or supervisor, or if your workplace has one to the human resources department, and you can make complaints to all of these uh, uh, different persons at work. And so I think what we've learned today um, from everyone is that it's always important to report. And if you're a bystander, uh, you have rights to, even if the harassment is not directed at you, but you've been subject, subjected to it in your work environment, you have the ability to make a complaint to human resources or your manager or with the DFEH or EEOC. Even if you don't have membership in that protected class, you should be protected by anti-discrimination laws and you can make a report. So the bottom line is don't tolerate the discrimination, document and report. So with that, thank you for your time and back to you, uh, Commissioner Campos. Thank you, Commissioner Zielinski. Uh, and, and with that, um, I see a couple of questions in the chat and I will direct um, the first couple and then there's one more. Um, so I'll direct the first to Commander Ruby Flores and um, um, victim's attorney, Adrian Rojas. And those questions are related to what is, what is the recommendation or what would you say about um, incidents that take place in unincorporated areas uh, of LA County or just outside the city or county 
And then what would you say if a bystander believes, or, or a victim for that matter, believes that the, uh, the assailant is uh, a minor? So someone under age. And it would, yes, Commander Ruby Fuss. Okay. Thank you. So I'll, I'll address that. I'm sure I'll have to look to my buddy Adrian for some help on <laughs> part of it. But um, yeah, I would say that the, the same advice applies regardless of if you're within the city of LAPD or the city, or if you're on the outskirts, that would probably be Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, or there might be some other small departments like Bell Gardens, um, you know, Inglewood. If, Every, I think the bottom line is, is that all of law enforcement has the same um, intent to provide equal protection for everyone. And it is, uh, it is the law. It's not specific to where you live. A hate crime is a hate crime and a hate incident is a hate incident in which the police will respond um, and protect you. Um, in terms of, of resources and things like that, those are available to you regardless of where you live. Um, if you're not sure of what area polices your area, when you call 911, you provide as much information to the dispatcher and they will determine if you're calling the right area or they tran they'll transfer you to the respective agency. And we with LAPD, we try to share information with other agencies as well so that we can understand what is happening, what, um, if there are particular groups that are being targeted, if there's any trends in some of the crimes that are happening in terms of, of location, um, weapons being used, things like that. We wanna have as much information that we have so that we can react and, and really prevent and work together to prevent these crimes against our communities. Right, and I, I absolutely agree with Commander Flores. Um, with regards to the self-defense laws, it's it's a, a state law, so th those law that law would apply regardless of whether the incident happened in Carson, in Torrance, in Manhattan Beach, or in Riverside, or in anywhere in the Inland Empire, or any other county in California. The self-defense analysis would apply. Um, across the state. Um, with regards to the resources, the county, at the county level, each county is required to have a victim's uh, resource center at the DA's office, and that's, that's required by the state. So if you're in Riverside County, your resource center would be at the Riverside County DA's office. If you are in uh, Orange County, your resource center would be at the Orange County DA's office. Uh, but also at the state level, uh, the victim's compensation board and that is at the state level that is available to any victim regardless of if you're in an unincorporated area uh, in LA County or Riverside or Orange County or if you are in within um, uh, LA County or Orange County that state victim compensation board is available to you. Now with regards to the second question of if the assailant is a minor um, that also goes into the proportionality and the reasonable reasonableness of your force when you are employing self-defense. So if the minor is bigger than you, or if the minor is armed, or if the minor is attacking you, um, you still have to use the same amount of uh, reasonable force and it must be proportionate. And the fact that the assailant is a minor um, doesn't play into a, the factor unless um, you are over and you, you are exceeding your bounds of reasonableness and proportionality. Great, thank you both. Um, and now um, I'll pose a question to Akivina Soriano Versosa and Abigail Zelensky. Um, and that is, um, what, was, what would your thoughts be on um, the culture change needed to happen to prevent these incidents from happening in the workplace, specifically in the workplace, uh, where you both, uh, um, places you both know very well in your work, um, but in general in LA, what would you, say is some of the culture change um, that we should work on um, to avoid these incidents from increasing uh, in the future? Um, I, can, I can start off. I, I think um, training, training helps. So uh, in California, there's already a requirement um, to have sexual harassment training for all employees, not just supervisors, you know, there's a minor portion of it um, that discusses, you know, 
the various protected classes as well, um, though it focuses mostly on sexual harassment training. But that doesn't mean just because it isn't required that employers can't go a step above and beyond and just you know train their employees, um, and especially from the top down, um, to have a respectful workplace. Um, I think it's also very helpful to have some sort of policy or handbook that just um, delineates what uh, is respectful conduct and you know what uh, is not allowed in the workplace. Yes, well, um, in the workplace specifically, um, you know, when uh, workers are organized and, uh, you know, are able to either through a union or even just being able to work collectively with other workers in their um, employment site, that gives a lot more um, power for um, everyone to feel empowered to be able to speak out and to be able to raise issues um, either proactively or when they're coming up and, and can demand for things like the trainings that um, that uh, Commissioner Zelensky is talking about um, and also advocate for um, you know strong uh, policies in an in um, employment uh, settings that speak strongly against uh, discrimination um, and that have a clear policy um, and process for then addressing um, incidents of, um, or environments of, um, you know, where these, uh, these things might happen. Um, just on a larger level too, in terms of like the what needs to shift in terms of culture and narrative is also um, we as a society need to hold accountable public officials and leaders who are actually, um, you know, uh, promoting um, some of these basic concepts that are um, are sparking hate and blame, such as you know blaming China, blaming um, Asians for um, for this pandemic, for example, um, that there really needs to be more of a public um, a public outcry against um, those who are in very visible positions of power actually promoting these kinds of narratives as well. Right on. And with that uh, brilliant closing, I see we're coming up at time. So I would like to take one last moment to thank our wonderful panelists. Uh, thank you to the City of Los Angeles, um, Executive Director Maddox and Councilmember Cedillo uh, for being here and making this training possible. Um, I do want to announce for the public that these monthly Know Your Rights and Bystander Intervention Trainings will take place um, at the end of every month with the next one on October 26th at 5.30 p.m. You could sign up at bit.ly slash stop hate trainings for more information on stopping hate or to find resources mentioned today, visit civilandhumanrights.lacity.org slash LA for all or Google LA, LA City Civil Rights and you'll uh, be taken right to us. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for all that you do day in and day out uh, to prevent and stop hate in LA. Uh, thank you to all the people who attended for being and um, striving to be better Angelinos and great neighbors to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Much appreciated.